this. We have completed the section on Togao in Yeshu Lama, and you should continue with your practice on that. Practice is the most important part, so continue doing that practice as much as you can. We've had some beautiful days lately, so a great opportunity to do that, even though it's a little chilly. Um, as much as you can, even just looking out through a window to do your sky gazing is, is okay, or a different object, a candle indoors, for example, or other light you could use for that. So uh, very important, though, that you do the practice. Now then, we move on to the next section of the text, which is for those of middling faculty. So we were doing it for highest faculty before, all of you, for doing those practices. <laughs> And so uh, we should do that, but the text goes on and, and in this next section this week and next week we'll be talking about the middling level and then the lesser level as we go through these. So this one deals primarily with the bardos. It divides them into four bardos. There are different ways of characterizing different bardos, but this one talks about the four bardos, which is basically the bardo of this life, the bardo of dying, the bardo of dharmata, and the bardo of becoming. And it uses slightly different terminology here, as, as we will see for names of each of those. But those are the ones that we're talking about here. So continuing the oral transmission of the text, the second section, for those of middling faculty, is a precise explanation of the instructions of the liberation in the bardo as stated in reverberation of sound. If defined by categories, there are four. Thus, the natural bardo, which would be the one, the bardo of this life, the moment of death, or dying, the nature of phenomena, or dharmata, and existence, which is the bardo of becoming are the four decisive boundaries that delineate the bardos. So now he goes through each of these. We won't go get through all four of them today, but we'll get through two and a half. So we start with the natural bardo, or the bardo of this life. First, the natural bardo is as follows. The general condition of sentient beings is such that the habit of previous passions is impressed upon the basis of all. It relates to karma becoming a, the seed that creates future habits. By the power of individual karma, there is a force that propels beings to take rebirth in various environments and classes and states of happiness, suffering, and indifference. That which is called potential means that through the single cause of ignorance, that's the root cause of all of this, the distinctions of duality are created, based on the aspects of corresponding results, the beings of the six classes appear. So traditionally in Buddhism, that's how we describe the, the causes of these various states. Concerning this, a single substance is perceived differently by each sentient being through the power of their individual karma. For instance, the substance water is perceived by the gods as nectar, humans as water, animals as a drink to quench thirst, deprived spirits as pus and blood, and by hell beings as molten lava. Very common uh, metaphor there that he's using. Although perceived in those ways, water has no true inherent existence, at least in that sense. In the Buddha's office way of life, it states, who has created the ground of the earth as an iron-hot inferno? Where does this fire arise from? The Buddha taught that this, is, this and everything like it is the result of the negative mind. So it, has, uh, it is as taught. In this way, the moment that the arrangement of appearances constituting the three realms dawns, that is entrance into the natural bardo. For those of us who are human beings, the five aggregates obscure the appearance of the five kayas. The elements and sense organs obscure the luster of clear light. Karma and passions obscure the appearance of nature of phenomena. So he's referring to these different characteristics and the, the role that they play in creating the obscurations that we experience. Consequently, there come to be the present independent experiences of happiness and sorrow. Knowing that this leads only to faulted states of future rebirth, the method to reverse it is determined by understanding the way of the natural bardo in order to serve the 
sever the cord of doubt. For example, among birds, the finch is extremely clever, since before building a nest, it carefully checks to see if there is any danger or threat from humans. Once the nest is determined safe, whenever the finch enters the nest, there is no hesitation. Similarly, at this moment of the narrow passageway, the unsurpassable, indispensable guide is called the lamp of hearing that dispels the darkness of ignorance. Holding the meaning of this in mind, it is important to sever all doubts with certainty derived from hearing and contemplating. So we receive the teachings through hearing or through reading, as the case may be, and then we contemplate them, we think about them a little bit, and then we practice. Nevertheless, since in the present time most beings are tormented by various degrees of discouragement and degeneracy, it is as stated in the treasury of the precious genuine meaning. During the age of excellence, even all gurus were only mahasiddhas. Based on the individual's karma and the guru's compassion and omniscience, liberation would occur solely through the potency of the dharma according to the personal karmic connections and aspirations. Conversely, nowadays it is difficult to be endowed with such fortunate karma. With countless concepts proliferating, it is almost impossible to cut through even a single thought. That is why it is essential for all ordinary individuals to thoroughly train through hearing and contemplating. Once one arrives at the time of the conclusion of this heart essence doctrine, practice is then referred to as devotion-based. So once we've studied it, we've uh, understood it through contemplation and so forth, then devotion becomes particularly important. Given that this king of secrets is the pinnacle of all doctrines, except for those who are capable of great hearing and contemplating and those who, and whose wisdom and fortunate, fortune are supreme, it is impossible for this meaning to be realized. Therefore, to enter this vehicle, it is necessary to largely depend upon the cultivation of hearing and contemplating. Thus, and the quote continues, in particular, the guru must know the unmistaken path, for if not, whatever is taught will be mistaken. Therefore, vast hearing and contemplation must be developed first. <clears throat> Thus, these are my heartfelt words of advice for the beings of the 500-year period of degeneration. So then he goes on to the moment of death. Well, basically what he's talking about in the first bardo, the bardo of this life, is that we need to do the practice, we need to study, contemplate, do the practice and so forth so that it will benefit us. And as we saw in the previous section of those of higher capacity, that we are through doing those practices able to achieve enlightenment in this lifetime. So then he goes on to the bardo of the moment of death, or the bardo of dying. Second, the bardo of the moment of death is as follows. In conjunction with the sun and the moon, it states life is impermanent, like a traveler on a journey who never stays in one place. Thus, once there is birth, death is naturally looming. In the conjunction of the sun and the moon and all Upadesha literature, there are extensive explanations on how the signs of death occur and how to deceive death. By understanding this, one can reverse sudden obstacles. Otherwise, it is as the quote states, there is no direction on this earth where anyone has ever been spared the arm of death itself. So basically, the fact is that we're all going to die. If we were born, we are, in fact, going to die in some way, unless, of course, we're able to somehow miraculously attain a, a a uh, form of rainbow body without having died. There are a few of those cases. And thus, as taught according to the teachings given in the Sutra of Advice to the King, the actual boundary of defining the time of death begins when the illness causing the circumstance of death strikes until the inner breath stops. During that period of time, it is crucial to know the oral advice so that whatever is vague becomes vivid as a damsel's image of herself in a mirror. Now, when it talks about until the inner breath stops, usually in Tibetan Buddhism we divide that process of dying into two steps. There's the breath itself, the outer breath, and then there's the dissolution of consciousness. And we go into the state of just total emptiness, or I guess I shouldn't use the word emptiness in this case, um, total nothingness 
nothingness, an experience of total nothingness. And so once the dissolution of the ordinary consciousness is all the consciousnesses goes away, then that is the moment of death in the Tibetan Buddhist view. So then in, con uh, in conjunction with the sun and the moon, it states, this is the time that all Upadeshas, the guru, must merge with the discipline's stream, disciples' stream of mind. Thus, if the dying individual is a great, practitioner, great perfection practitioner, that's you, like a carefree child, not keeping track of details, he or she will be unconcerned with the signs, place, or time of death. If that is the case, these instructions will not be necessary. So when you've done those other practices, you are well prepared for when death arrives. And so these bardo instructions aren't necessary because you won't enter these various bardos. Or you may just enter the, the first of these bardos, the bardo of dying. The best middling capacity will be indifferent to the circumstances or place, whether death occurs on a road or an intersection in a city. This is how a homeless vagrant would die. An average practitioner's death would be beyond concern for external circumstances, like a wild animal such as a lion who dies in the mountains, in a cave, or in an empty valley. Engaging with the kayas and wisdom, this is referred to as entering the innate clear light, or entering the pure realms through POA instructions. And so the most common things for advanced practitioners that we see are recognizing this experience of clear light. Everybody has the experience, but recognizing it is a different matter. And so the practices that we've been doing are a way of helping to prepare us to recognize that experience. The other, of course, is the POA, the transference of consciousness. And so that is something that is done uh, as a person is in the process of dying. Once You don't want to do it unless you're certain that they are actually dying, but at that point in time. Or it can actually be done by a third party for you after the moment of death. Uh, usually it's said within the three days of actually dying. Uh, that POA can also be performed by uh, a third party. In both cases of entering, success depends upon the power of familiarity. Meditation. Okay? Uh, the word familiarity in uh, Tibetan is used for meditation. That's how we familiarize ourselves with these practices. The, the visualization for the first is stated in the conjunction of the sun and the moon. The way to engage in the union of kayas and wisdom is to direct awareness as follows. Now here it's talking about togao. With the body in the sleeping lion posture, direct awareness to the eyes, allow the gaze to rest momentarily in space. If space and awareness are, sup are stable, the person will have no bardo and Buddhahood will surely be achieved. So when we recognize that, we're just staring into space, and we recognize that it's the nature of our mind, then we don't go into the bardos. And thus, assuming one of the three postures or remaining in the sleeping lion posture, so these are the three postures that we've talked about, Focus awareness on the eyes. With eyes directed to the space of awareness, relinquish the present life and relax uncontrived within original purity. In an instant, liberation will occur. This is also called introducing the secret path. Since this is an extremely profound key point, even while one is alive, when the sky is pristine, direct awareness into space and think, the moment of death has arrived. Now I must pass into the peaceful, unelaborate expanse. So this would be a variation on your sky gazing practice, to think about this and use it as a preparation for the bardo. Exhale the breath and follow that by allowing the mind to remain without focus. The general, no object to focus here. This path is extremely swift. For the latter, it states in the Tantras, the way of entering into various realms is as follows. So this one talks about Poa. The teachings of the re, for reanimating the dead and transferring consciousness are practiced by the consciousness mounting the winds. Now, reanimating the dead is a particular practice of Poa that 
for the most part, is not taught anymore uh, because it involves uh, bringing somebody back from the dead and then taking over that body. Uh, so usually it's the transfer of consciousness that uh, it was referred to here as well. Our practice by consciousness mounting the winds, for that it is important to have previous experience through training. So we have to do the practice for these to be able to do these. It is also important to concentrate and transfer awareness. Then, with hick, the consciousness is ejected. This depends upon the guru's oral instructions. So there are various forms of these practices. Um, there are practices associated with each of the three kayas, for example, but each of them have somewhat separate instruction. Lineages vary somewhat in their instructions and so forth. He continues on then, thus during the final moments of the last breath, awareness as a white awe in the heart is ejected directly up through the crown aperture. So the awe is visualized as being in there and then we're repeating hick, hick, hick goes up and then is ejected into the heart of, usually uh, Amitabha is the one used, although others could be there as well directly up to the crown aperture by reciting hick 21 times liberation will occur so the hick is repeated different times and it depends on the particular text uh, this says 21 times i've had teachings where it was just seven times i've had where it's seven times from this chakra to this chakra and seven more here and seven more here and so forth uh, before it's ejected and so forth which sounds like what it's talking about in this case and just as mentioned at the Tantras, it is important to train while still alive. Those endowed with this key point need not depend upon stages of disillusion. Through the Bodhisattva's manner of transferring breath, they will pass beyond sorrow. At this time, the clarification through verbal elaboration is necessary. It is best to receive this from one's guru. If that is not possible, the Vajra relative with undefiled Samaya should recite as follows. <clears throat> o fortunate child, this clear light is actual wisdom that originates from itself. Let your mind remain in its nature without contrivance and you will unimpededly arrive in the state of Buddhahood. If through this mind it is still unable to do away with concepts, eject awareness as a white awe out of the crown aperture like a flung arrow. In the upper direction is a realm of perfectly pure space. It is there that the conqueror known as the king of space dwells. Endowed with the empowerment of the ground, the fundamental nature of great perfection, fortunate one fearlessly receive it. Depart for the appearance of the ground nature of phenomena and you will achieve Buddhahood in the ground of original purity. If by chance liberation does not occur, rec recognize all appearances of the bardo of the nature of phenomena to be your own. So when these things are happening, if you just recognize that this is all based on your own mind, okay, that's the critical point there. At that moment you recognize your own nature, joyfully depart for the space of original purity. And then this, because this is through guidance of somebody else, is then repeated three times as a part of that. The king of space mentioned in here, I believe, is a reference to Samatavadra. Um, uh, it's not real clear and there's no footnote as to what it is, but in terms of the context of space and what it's referring to here, that sounds like what would be uh, being referred to. But as I mentioned, oftentimes Amitabha is used in his pure land of Dewa Chen. Uh, that's real common in a lot of these practices, uh, but also the other ones. Uh, the copper-colored mountain, the Padmasambhava, or uh, the pure land of the Dakinis uh, with Vajrayogini or one of the other uh, significant Dakinis and so forth. So continuing on then, thus, having repeated this three times, the instructor should also remain in equipoise. So the, whoever, if you're doing this, you would provide that guidance to them and then you would rest in equipoise, meditative equipoise at that point. These instructions are exceptionally sublime because they are drawn from the naturally occurring great perfection and other texts. Here, despite having received the Upadesha, uh, the instructions, if one does not have full confidence, 
with the ordinary individuals, retraction of the channels and winds begins with the four outer elements, with the five inner aspects of space, and with the five secret life forces. Now, I'm not exactly sure what these refer to. Commonly, we talk about this as the dissolution first of the elements, which would kind of match what is referred to here. Uh, but then the, the consciousnesses, uh, dissolution of the consciousness into that, uh, uh, what is sometimes called the black hole, this the nothingness, if you will, uh, prior to the arrival of the um, uh, clear light. Uh, but this has a little bit different with the five inner aspects of space and the five secret life forces. Uh, these could be references to things like the empties and the blisses, or they could be references to the uh, different winds and the wisdoms associated with those. I'm just not sure. All additional 20 winds will dissolve according to the subtle stages of decomposition. Although this is explained in detail in the Tantra naturally arising, that which is presented here is so that ordinary individuals can easily understand. The way the elements dissolve and the winds depart is stated in the conjunction of the sun and the moon. So here he gives us an explanation of some of this. When the earth element dissolves back into the earth, the body becomes heavy, unable to rise. The ability to stand and move diminishes when the water element dissolves back into water. Fluids issue from the mouth and nostrils. Similarly, when the fire element dissolves back into fire, the mouth and nose completely dry up. The body loses heat from the extremities inward. Likewise, when the wind element dissolves back into wind, breath becomes erratic, the limbs struggle, and the eyes roll back into the head. Whoever experiences these signs is departing from this world. So these are the dissolution of the elements part of that process. Uh, and this, this is a fairly common description that varies a little bit from one source to another, but it's pretty, uh, pretty similar. Thus, and in the clear expanse, it states, when the wind that mobilizes the body departs, the body can no longer raise itself up and the hamstrings tremble. The limbs will not contract and speech becomes difficult. The eyes roll back and the breath is exhaled. When the wind that gives the physical complexion luster disparts, departs, the entire body, as well as the area around the mouth and nose, becomes a gray color like smoke. Pain shoots through the muscles and a foul stench issues from the mouth and nose. When the wind that separates impure substances from the pure departs the body, one can no longer eat or drink, and the strength of the body diminishes. When the wind that distributes heat throughout the body departs, the warmth of the body escapes from the extremities. The splendor and luster of the body fades. When the wind of the karma of the eon escapes, the body trembles uncontrollably, and the blood and veins and capillaries retracts into the aorta. Thus, and the quote continues, at the time appearances dissolve as follows, all outer sensory perceptions and recollections dissolve so that everything becomes like darkness of night. Awareness dissolves into the center of the heart, memory fades, and speech no longer functions. Now, the way that I was generally taught with these is slightly different after the dissolution of the elements, then there's the appearance of a white a sky, uh, you know, a white, a general whiteness, and then that gradually transitions into a red color, and those are linked with the uh, descent first of the white drop, the male drop, from the crown down to the heart, and then the female drop, the red drop, coming up uh, from the navel up uh, to the heart is the red, and then when they enclose around the uh, the heart essence, then that creates the black. And so that is the moment of death in most of the texts that I'm familiar with. Thus, at this point, the so-called mind is the radiance of awareness carried by the wind mind in the lungs like a blind horse. When this combination, wind mind separates and the radiance of awareness dissolves into awareness in the heart, it is like a crippled man. All winds, without exception, pass through the path of the windpipe to flow out the mouth and nose. When the wind can no longer return, it is called the separation of mind and wisdom or the time of death. 
At that time, it is beneficial to rely upon the three precious Upadeshas of the great profound Tantra conjunction of the sun and moon. So here it's talking about the stopping of breathing in the death process. <clears throat> so here from the uh, Tantra, joining one's mouth and nostrils with the persons whose recollection has diminished uh, and the comment that is in the text, the note in the text talks about it being kind of like mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Forcefully exhale three long breaths of air. With the first breath, imagine a white om. With the second, a red ah. And with the third, exhale and abide in emptiness. Then, with each inhale, imagine that the individual's consciousness returns to their body as a blue hung. And at the same instant, recite Hong with such force that the intestines retract to touch the spine. <laughs> That's going to take a lot of force <laughs> to do that. Uh, the eyes of the individual should then fly open. At that time, introduce the luminosity of the empty vital essence called uh, pointing out instructions. So these are the actual instructions. Oh, fortunate one, this is the clear light of your own nature. At this time of separation from your body, the three doors are no longer an obstruction. So, although the bardo of the nature of phenomena, including all the sounds and lights, arises in all its glory, it does not other than your it is not other than your own appearances. You must recognize this, since this present naked awareness is actual liberation itself. Do not deviate. Do you see the appearances? Do you hear the instructions? Thus, if there is a response or a sign becomes apparent, the transmission was successful. If there are indications that the individual's consciousness is clear or sense organs are vaguely alert, shape paper into a cone or use a piece of bamboo and place your mouth at one end while inserting the other into the individual's ear, saying, fortunate, oh fortunate child, don't be attached to anything. You have separated from your corporal body of flesh and blood. It is pointless to be afraid of the bardo of the nature of phenomena's radiant light and sound. Recognize that your own appearances do not actually exist and seize the immutable resting place. If you are unable to abide there, bring to mind the pure realm of great bliss. Generate devotion and depart. Have no doubt that you will meet the Buddha of boundless light. So here is a reference to Amitabha. Thus melodiously recite. It is excellent if this is recited when the stages of dissolution began. This is the exceptional key point known as the consummate introduction. Furthermore, it states in the conjunction of the sun and the moon, if the dying individual is still breathing, there is no doubt that the individual will be led from that state by the syllables, breath, and so forth. The syllables would be the things that are being recited to them, the breath being that kind of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation thing that was uh, referenced in there, and then the other kinds of practices along with that. These are a little bit different than what's described in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is another case where it goes through some of these same processes. They're similar, but they are somewhat different. Thus, most ordinary beings who have never heard this dharma before will indicate their future place of rebirth through body language and other signs. The method to lead them to higher states from the time of death process begins until consciousness departs is as follows. So here we're getting to the point of where the breath has stopped, and so now uh, we're talking about that dissolution of consciousness. Visualize a white awe in the individual's ear. Place your mouth close to their crown aperture. As they exhale, slowly and melodiously recite awe many times as the age of the dying person. So this is a little bit different description than the one that was given in the text that he was quoting from earlier. When it is apparent that the person's last breath has expired, at that very moment recite ah 21 times. If steam emits from the crown, even though the individual may have committed many non-virtues, they will be led to a higher realm. Those already destined for a higher rebirth will be held, will be able to be led to an even higher state. If by chance an individual displays the signs of hell realm rebirth, 
in order to prevent their direct descent. At the moment the person separates from their breath, visualize the consciousness in their heart as awe, and while reciting awe, simultaneously imagine that it melts into five lights. Mingle this with your mind and rest. Now that's very similar to uh, what Padmas Bhava uses as uh, what he calls the Dharmakaya Poa. And this is something that uh, is done uh, at the time of death yourself using the awe. And the awe just kind of floats up out uh, through the crown and into the heart of Amitabha or other deity um, that you visualize at that time. So this is somewhat similar to that. If the guide possesses high realization because of the consciousness of the deceased is by nature clear light, this will unite with the truth of the nature of phenomena. As exceptional key point of guiding the consciousness, this is a sublime feature of the king of vehicles. Like the example of a king on his horse struck by a cannonball fired by the minister, all the blood in the body condenses into the aorta as pools of blood surge into the aorta in three stages. The length of the breath is also different at each stage during the three exhalations. Finally, when the outer breath ceases, the winds dissolve into the consciousness. Uh, consciousness awareness momentarily falls unconscious in the center of the heart. It is during that state of unconsciousness that the inner breath ceases. As stated in the clear expanse, as the blood in the body condenses, when the first pool of blood strikes the aorta, both the mouth and eyes become pale. Breath is exhaled the length of a cubit. So let your forearm, length of a forearm. Then the second pool of blood strikes, the head falls forward, and the breath is flung in the distance of an arrow. When the third surge of blood strikes, the sound of the ick, the breath shoots out the length of the arm span. Then the outer breath ceases, awareness falls unconscious in the heart, and when the inner breath ceases, that is when the bardo, the nature of phenomena, dawns. So it is taught. So a little bit different explanations and descriptions of what happens, but uh, very similar to that that we've had in other sources as well. So then we move on to the bardo of the nature of phenomena. So now we've gone through the bardo of dying, we're at that point, and then the bardo of uh, dharmata. Third, the bardo of the nature phenomena is as follows. Once the support of self-fixation, the heap of aggregates, has been discarded, the clear light manifestation of one's own inner nature appears. At that time, it is necessary to possess the oral instructions in order to trust one's own appearances, like a child joining his mother's lap. So this is the, the reference to the merging of the child and mother clear light. So the mother clear light being the real thing, if you will, and the, the child clear light being like our understanding and experience through practice of that clear light. This analogy reflects the profound connection between mother and child, and not only that, just after birth, even animals are capable of knowing their mother, among many, through their karmic connection, singling her out to suckle without hesitation. The practice of treksho imbues realization of the ground of awareness as great nature of original purity abiding like the mother. From that phenomena that arise from the appearance of the ground are like the child, becoming familiar with that through togao, like the child recognizing its mother and joining her in the bardo, one recognizes that both the nature and its own strength are like the sun and its own rays, gain, gaining certainty that this is not other than one's own appearances. At, them, at the moment of discernment, Buddhahood occurs without a bardo, like a child uniting with its mother. So now you can see how the practices of Trek Cho and Togao fit into this experience of the clear light and the, the uh, bardo of the nature of phenomena. Moreover, the methods of this exceptional secret path are as follows. When all stages of dissolution and restricted corporal body are complete, and the connection between the body and mind has ended, the consciousness of the basis of all, devoid of memory and thought processes, although said to dissolve into space, actually dissolves into the basic space of phenomena. 
In that instant, the natural clear light dawns like a cloudless autumn sky, with no boundaries whatsoever, having not fallen to any extreme, empty clarity arises free from the evil, excuse me, <laughs> the veil of obscurity. Recognize and rest in this very nature without contrivance. This is referred to as the ground of the great original state of liberation. The distinction of the six special features sets this apart from the ground of confusion, so liberation is immediate and the great inner space of original purity. So when we recognize that and we understand what it is through our study and our practice, that is when we recognize that this is the enlightened state. Concerning this, it states in the omniscient one's ocean of profound meaning that the place where liberation occurs when space dissolves into clear light is called the first instant. This phase presents the connection with what follows the second and third instants. Nevertheless, the complete Upadeshas that represent a conclusive analysis through the oral instructions can be understood in the lamp that illuminates the key points of practice and other texts. In addition, the concise and extensive explanations as well as those given on the obscured and hidden meaning presented through the six limitations and the four abodes are not easily comprehended. And there is a note that explains what those refer to. Although I am inclined to shoot the arrow of scriptural reference and reasoning concerned all, concerning all of this, given that this is an Upadesha text and the main emphasis is on the meaning, I have taken care not to abuse an abundance of words. <laughs> so trying to be very uh, pithy in the instructions here. If liberation does not occur at that time, that which is referred to as the dissolution of space into clear light occurs. It states in the conjunction of the sun and the moon, this is referred to as an ordinary individual's consciousness dissolving into clear light. At the moment the continuum of breathing ceases, except for the aspect of one's own organs, substantial appearances have ceased, yet the thought that they are there still occurs. When the corporal body is no longer visible, the body of light becomes evident. Then the entire field of experience appears as a mandala of five colored rays. So it's talking about the, the two forms of dying here. So you can die with an ordinary body or you die in, with a rainbow body. Thus, although time does not change, appearances do change. So the external earth, stones, mountains, cliffs, forests, the sun, the moon, and so forth, the entire support of the universe and its inhabitants will fade. Wherever one looks, it will seem as though the bolt of brocade silk is unfurling or through covered by, though covered by a thin piece of muslin while looking through the rays at the sun. All appearances will be extremely bright and colorful, devoid of distinctions such as outer, inner, wide, or narrow. Everything will seem as though buoyant and shimmering with a dazzling radiance. At that time, to the extent that one is familiar with toga practice, these appearances will be supportive aspects of awareness enduring for extended periods of time. For those who are unfamiliar, they will disappear as swiftly as a shooting star. So when we're not familiar with this practice of the clear light and experience of that, then there is a very brief flash of appearance and it's gone. And we don't recognize it and it was just something that came and went, you know, like a quick reflection of the mirror of a car going by or something, you know, it just kind of flashes, there's a bright light and it's gone. So here with the practice we're able to recognize what's going on and it's also said that the longer we're able to do these practices the longer we're going to recognize it there's a longer opportunity uh, to recognize what is actually going on at that point in time the manner in which awareness sustains its own place is stated in the root tantra at that time when the appearance of the light is spherical those who are knowledgeable will sustain the arising of the visions and thus, as the visions arise, those with naturally relaxed concentration will recognize them to be their own. So again, here, as is often repeated in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, if we recognize them as our, the nature of our mind, then we will attain enlightenment. 
In the first instant, one will have the confidence of knowing one's appearances lack true existence. In the second instant, they will be liberated in their own place. In the third instant, the immutable state of liberation will be secured. From that moment onward, there will be no visions at all. So we will have achieved enlightenment. Then, clear light dissolving into non-duality is as stated in the conjunction of the sun and the moon. Then for ordinary individuals, so somebody that did not attain enlightenment at that time, for ordinary individuals, that which is referred to as clear light dissolving into non-duality is as follows. All appearances arise only in the form of kayas. The kayas are not too large or small, are the same proportion, are adorned with ornaments, and have their own colors, postures, thrones, and mudras. So then we begin to see these uh, images that are referred to in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, so thus, when the visions arise in the form of the wrathful deities, so over here we have a depiction of the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities, and so that's what uh, we would see. But first, uh, first we typically have the peaceful ones and then the wrathful ones, but here we're talking about the wrathful ones. Thus, when the visions arise in the form of wrathful deities, those kayas within the palace of the cranium, although no larger than mustard seeds, will seem so colossal in the bardo that it will seem as though they encompass the universe. Conversely, they will also appear as minute as the mustard seeds while remaining perfectly proportioned. In all cases, the way that their heads and mannerisms appear will be unpredictable. Brandishing various magical weapons, they will be striking out, causing panic and fear. Their roar will be so loud and terrifying that it will resemble the unceasing sound of a thousand dragons. Their radiance will imbue fear like penetrating weapons. It states in the clear expanse, at the, that time sounds and lights will gather and the appearance of the kayas will be utterly terrifying. And so this is when you don't recognize that this is just your mind. You know, you might think of it a little bit like a, uh, a nightmare. You know, when you have a nightmare, the kind of terrifying things going on at that time. If you recognize it's just a dream, no big deal. You can actually play with it and enjoy it, have fun with it. Well, the same thing here. If you recognize that this is like a dream, it's an experience of your mind, then you'll no longer be terrified by this and able to deal with it. <clears throat> it states in the clear expanse, at that time sounds, lights uh, will gather, appearance of the kayas will be utterly terrifying. Here, as if it were stuffed lion. It is necessary to be fearless and gain confidence, not to react to one's own appearances. Uh, so if you went to the Wildlife Museum out here in Tucson, uh, you see all of these stuffed animals, no need to fear, right? Um, they're not going to affect you. The way in which even all ordinary individuals who are excellent practitioners could still revert back to samsara is as stated in the Upanishad of the excellent wisdom intent. Alas, holder of the secret, if the nature is not recognized now, Buddha nature will not be attained, no matter how much meditation has been practiced. Having not encountered the key Upadesha, the lights will produce fear, the sounds will bring panic, and the glare will bring terror. If you do not encounter the key point of the instructions, you will fail to recognize the sounds, lights, and glare, these three, so you will once again wander in existence. Samsara. So it is. All the tantras of the great yoga reveal, to a certain degree, the illusory body of the bardo arising as the Sambhokakaya. But because they are not the tantras of the Upanishad, the actual aspect of these appearances of natural spontaneous presence is concealed. So when we're doing these various deity practices, these are giving us, a, you know, we often time talk about plan A and plan B that I have referred to previously. So plan A is to be prepared uh, to attain enlightenment in this lifetime. Plan B, if that doesn't work out, we can recognize these things going on at the time they occur in the bardo. So in the Sambhokakaya form, when we recognize them in that Sambhokakaya form, they're actually there to help us, even though on the surface they may appear to be wrathful and terrifying and so forth. 
Uh, this is more sublime than holding to independent appearances and never knowing that enlightenment occurs in the space of one's own appearances as the Sambhogakaya. So if we don't know that, we're more likely to be terrorized by it. It is as the taught in the sixfold expanse, the bardo of the pure nature of phenomena and the magical body of the meditation deity are so similar that they can be mistaken. So they look real, all right, when you see it. It's like in a dream, things look like they are real. But once we wake up and recognize the dream, we realize, well, they weren't really real, so to speak. Thus it is. Likewise, the peaceful appearances are as follows. In the conjunction of the sun and the moon, it states, even all the kayas appear in a group formation of five, each with the consort, each with a group of five, is surrounded by rings of light. All the mandalas, the families of the male, the, female, the families of the female, and the male and female sattvas abide as one. <clears throat> so these, there are uh, opportunities after having seen each, usually you see these one by one, the, the different deities one by one. And then there's a period where they appear as families. And so whoever the, the head of the family would be, let's say uh, Verachana, would appear and they would appear with his consort and then there would be a pair of uh, bodhisattvas that would appear with them and so forth, all representing, in case of Verachana, white light. So there would be this glowing white light, fairly intense light coming from his heart out to you. And if you recognize that uh, and accept that, then uh, you can achieve enlightenment. <clears throat> if you don't recognize it, then it can appear rather uh, uh, wrathful and uh, scary. Thus, these visions of the group formations, the male and female five families, gradually develop. The way they arise according to stages for the duration of the five days of samadhi, like shoots from a seedling, is as follows. On the first day, Farajana, with the consort and assembly, appear in the principal family surrounded by a group formation of five. On the second day, Vajra Akshobhya appears. On the third day, Ratnasambhava. On the fourth day, Amitabha. And on the fifth day, Amogasiddhi appears as a principal in a group formation. Reference to a day of samadhi corresponds to the duration of time that the deceased was able to remain in samadhi. Here, liberation occurs through the three key points as quoted before from conjunction of the sun and the moon. At this time, a very subtle shaft of light will emerge from one's heart and connect to the hearts of all the Buddhas. If one can ascertain that, one will naturally abide in the non-conceptual concentration. This is referred to as awareness engaging with light. When all these appearances manifest and completely intermingle, countless subtle vital essences will emerge from the shaft of the light to the heart. Then once from one's heart, a twisted, multicolored filament of light will issue forth. As appearances arise, one will think that all kayas are dissolving into one's body. This is referred to as the light engaging back into awareness. At that time, all individuals with confidence in their own appearances must recall the supreme method, like a child joining its mother's lap. So again, it, uh, in this case, using different color lights, different experiences of beings and so forth, as opposed to the initial appearance of clear light, we have these very similar experience going on with the peaceful and wrathful deities and the five Buddha families. If stability in this is not achieved, then it is referred to as the non-duality of dissolving into wisdom. Although it is not elucidated elucidating the vision of the union of the four aspects of wisdom, the inner path of Vajrasattva, this can be understood in quote from the conjunction of the sun and the moon where it states, once again from one's heart the very subtle filament of light will emerge. This will appear that project upward into space. One looks at this without allowing the eyes to become distracted. Then it will seem enormous and unmingled with any other appearances. Then with a blanket of blue light, radiant vital essences will appear like overturned mirrors. Uh, in the note on that it says kind of like bowls, shallow bowls appearing like a sapphire cup turned over 
Endowed with the inner radiance of wisdom, this is the exceedingly bright and dazzling and naturally adorned with vital essences of five, each adorned with five. Above this, <clears throat> upon a blanket of white light, similar to an overturned cup, appear extremely radiant vital essences arising as before, including the inner radiance of wisdom. Then above this, upon a blanket of golden light, like an overturned golden cup, Everything arises just as before. Upon that, upon a blanket of red light, like an overturned ruby cup, the appearances will arise just like the preceding ones. Above that will appear a clear orb of light like the fan of a peacock. Although this is the appearance of the five aspects of wisdom, the manifestation of the wisdom, the all-accomplishing activity has not been perfected, so it will not be apparent. And this is called the vision of the union of the four aspects of wisdom. So when we talk about the, we usually talk about the five wisdoms of the four aspects is because it hasn't quite been completed yet. And is also referred to as the inner path of Vajrasattva. It is here where one must recall the supreme method like that which employs the unwavering golden needle. Uh, that's the, the golden needle is one that is referred to in the note as the kind of a needle that's used when somebody has uh, fluid around the heart sac and they need to pierce it to allow the fluid to come out and so sort of dig in. But you have to be very careful with it, otherwise the person winds up dying. And so that's kind of the metaphor that's being used here. Thus, just as it is taught in in the face of each appearance by resting in the unwavering equipoise of fresh and present awareness. It is analogous to how a skillful physician drains fluid surrounding the patient's heart. During the insertion of the golden needle, the key point is to ensure that the needle will not waver even a fraction of a hair so that the fluid can be easily drained from the heart. Similarly here, liberation occurs when awareness never wavers from its own place. At this point, the statement, since the noble qualities of basic space have not brought, been brought to completion, their full potential is not yet perfected, must be understood as referring to the union of the four aspects of wisdom. As the omniscient one states, here when liberation in the state of original purity has still not occurred, it is posited as the union of the four aspects of wisdom. The assertion of those with inferior intelligence that the wisdom of the all-accomplishing activity does not exist is utterly unacceptable. Okay, so recognize it, then we know that it, in fact it does exist. We don't deny that it exists. So as taught, when the actual result is perfected, that is the appearance of all five wisdoms. So once we've actually uh, accomplished that level, the, the fifth one shows up. This is why it is necessary to know the depth and breadth of the Tantra's wisdom intent. Then, what is referred to as the wisdom dissolving into spontaneous presence occurs as follows. From the thought that all previous visions and awareness dissolve into the upper orb of light, Original purity arises above like a stainless space. Below this, the wrathful mandala of the Samboka Kaya is extremely vast and rich. Below that, the peaceful Samboka Kaya mandala of the radiant light in the surrounding regions of the natural Namadakaya pure realms are all perfectly arranged. Further, below those, the confused appearances of the six classes of beings, including the six stages as their tamers appear. One's own appearances arise as a reflection referred to as the appearance of the ground that never wavers from the ground. The eight ways that these appearances arise are as follows. So now it gives a fairly detailed description of each of these. So first, by appearances arising as compassion with the force of the energy of compassion that engages in samsara, there is no differentiation between samsara and enlightenment. Second, by appearances arising as light, the aspect of appearances is radiant within. Third, by arising as kayas, as kayas appearances are completely undivided. Fourth, by arising as wisdom, they are unimpeded. Fifth, by arising as indivisible, awareness abides single-pointedly. And sixth, by arising free of boundaries, appearances are cleansed within the nature as it is. And seventh, by arising impurely, the origin of existence remains unceasing. 
and eighth. By appearances arising purely, the primordial mother and child unite. So this goes through, gives a little bit more explanation for each of those processes, ultimately resulting in the union of the child and mother clear light. At this time, as if reuniting with an old acquaintance, there is confidence, free from doubt, that the appearances are one's own. As in the analogy of an unhesitating thrust of the golden needle, remain confident without distraction and seize the immutable resting place. As in the example of the irreversible thrust of the flung arrow, seize the immutable ground and liberation will occur by unwaveringly resting in the innate nature. Although this reveals the eight modes of arising, they are unsullied by the mind that disengages from samsara and engages in enlightenment. So don't get caught up in the minutia, <laughs> the details of all of it. Nevertheless, the way of revealing the fault associated with what seems to be a connection between the eight modes in the mind is similar to the way a single consciousness seems to engage the six organs individually. So there would be the sense, sense organs that it's referring to here. So it would be the six senses. The meaning is understood through that example. In the Heap of Precious Jewels Tantra, it is clearly revealed that the nature is in the accord with great space. However, those who are deluded about the profound meaning of this crucial point explain in many ways that the visions of precious spontaneous presence are eight independent objective appearances. These are all mistaken. For that reason, in the Precious Genuine Meaning, it states that from this, even I, Long Chimpa himself, have discovered certainty about the key points of the heart essence. Thinking over these genuine explanations, I am extremely pleased to express the great joy I feel in knowing that the doctrine of the great perfection still endures, even now in this world, much like the setting sun. So that's where we will leave off for today, and then we'll continue next time with the remainder of, the, of this and then the last of the four bardos with that.